I would like to introduce our speaker for the workshop, whose name is John Schimmel. John is a technologist and tinkerer who teaches developing assistive technology and web development courses at NYU's Interactive Telecommunications Program. John is the co-sponsor of DIYA Ability, a company in New York City focusing on empowering people with and without disabilities to make their way through the world. So without any further ado, here is John Shen. Hello. I'm John. And we have a schedule. We have to end. Well, the end of the schedule ending was 340. Seems like everything got pushed back. We still have to end at 340. Because no, we we'll go 350. There's a rocket launch at 342. Oh. For Scott Kelly is being launched in Russia for a year. And you know, I can't wait to watch them. So we might end early or we just figure out it. We'll go watch them all later. There's a big screen, you can probably turn up the volume and watch the Soviet launch in Russia. Um, I'm a nerd. I'm self-proclaimed nerd. A lot of you guys are obviously nerds right here. You've heard the word tools. In the, in the world of, I'm going to find some new tools. So I want to tell you about some tools that I really have been enjoying the last few years working with. Um, and, and kind of how this, I'll talk about this is this will be an audio tour of my workshop uh, over in Midtown on 36th Street. And um, I share a space with the Adaptive Design Association who does amazing uh, adaptive and seating interesting devices for uh, children and uh, young adults with disabilities. They use cardboard to make a lot of their stuff. So it's a very um, uh, DIY do it yourself over there. We share space. We brought some tools in that I'll talk about. And our DIY ability is really about trying to get people with or without disabilities to make their world using existing technology, things that they can build together with simple components, uh, just learning the jargon to kind of make make them more involved in the process of the design and the production and natural things that we have to use in the world. Um, and the one good thing about it is you can imagine you can design the future this way. And so um, DIY ability is, uh, we're kind of uh, in limbo about what we actually are. Uh, we'll probably be in LLC in a little bit. But the ideal situation is we are an accessible workshop. And the accessible <coughs> part of it is that uh, we have some tools, some of them are dangerous, but we try to make it as safe and as accessible as possible. Um, and we have some projects and workshops that we do throughout the year for occupational therapists to come and learn, uh, people with disabilities to come and learn how the tools work, and um, kind of just how do we kickstart the, the process of getting people together in New York City that want to make things. Um, so. I did uh, fall into assistive technology when I was a graduate student at NYU, uh, the Interactive Telecommunication Program there, and I took, a, I took an assistive technology class, and our group, we made a uh, wheelchair DJ system. So we met a young guy who had cerebral palsy. Uh, he was 18, he was from Brazil, very suave, rapping to all of his nurses, flirting <laughs> with all of his nurses, but he had this propulsion in a wheelchair, a uh, gate that he propelled himself through the hallways, he had a lot of style. And so we were thinking, oh, we should just merge the wrapping and the, the wheelchair propulsion together. So the wheelchair DJ is a platform that is a, his chair sits on top of. It's a roller base, so we can get the speed and the direction of each wheel, map that into an audio file, and the left wheel face the right wheel scratches. It's kind of, it's kind of cool. Um, so I fell down the rabbit hole. This is the idea like assistive technology can really be not just this orthopedic looking stuff that you see in hospital catalogs, but really a mode for expressing creativity. And um, my friend, uh, Holly Cohen, uh, who's an occupational therapist at Rust, we got together and started the DIY ability off these ideas. Um, so if, we'll leave this pretty open. I'm gonna list some tools, and if you guys have questions, uh, if I start changing subjects and you have a question about a, a, a device or a tool that I'm talking about, feel free to raise your hand, shout out, um, and we'll try to keep the questions in the loop and be a little, because uh, it's important. This is a giant room, too. So, um, all right. So for workshops, what we kind of do, uh, this is more on the physical disability side. If you have um, a child who has a physical disability, we, we will offer workshops on toy hacking. 
And toy hacking was the simplest way to get people into uh, electronics. Who here took their toys apart as a child? Who here still takes their toys apart? <laughs> Not on purpose, yes. <laughs> it's harder and harder to take your toys apart today. Um, but they, you know, even CVS, Dwayne Reed, Rite Aid, all sell these little remote control cars that cost $15, and we ask people to bring those into the workshop, we show them how to switch adapt it, and the idea of switch adapting is if a person can use their head, or foot, or nose, or chin, shoulder blades, whatever they can move, that can be an access point to uh, modify the car to be more accessible. Um, one of the primary things is you can't use your hands as you use a remote control car. So you could bring it up with Play-Doh and Subaru and foam and make a foot pedal for it. Or you can take it apart and find a little bit of metal in there that you would adapt and then wire out the second switch. That leaves the first switch in place that continues to work. The second switch will just be um, an auxiliary one that you can add any switch into it. Um, Call this an act, you know, we usually call it hacking for the holidays. Uh, a lot of people don't like the word hacking. Try to we had an event at a hospital once and they just, they just take the word hacking out. So it was toy modification for the holidays. Um, not as fun. Um, and uh, we, we do have other stuff with just the general assistive technology. Uh, big believers and big proponents that if you have the right technology to get access to the computer, the computer is a wonderful proxy for the rest of the world. Both information-based and physical. Um, and going off of this, the, the next tools that we'll talk about are really just kind of a sum of like what's available now in the market to kind of make accessible workshops, um, uh, just places to tinker. Um, and a lot of them are accessible largely because they are computer-based. They usually have a USB port on them, which means they are controlled through software. Uh, some limitations come in with what software is actually accessible with the screen reader and what isn't. Um, okay, so what I will talk about today, we'll talk about a little electronics. Uh, how can you do that yourself? Uh, 3D printers, uh, CNC milling machines, laser cutters, computer controlled embroidery machines, uh, Bluetooth and internet connected devices. And that's kind of, I think a lot of people kind of heard the internet of things here, and that will be something we'll talk at the very end of that, because I think I would build up to that. That one's actually just still happening too. Um, so we'll start with 3D printing because it's kind of one of the best uh, examples of what's currently available for uh, accessible making right now. Um, you've probably seen articles about robotic hands being printed or prosthetic hands being printed for people who have kind of lost a hand or born without a hand. Uh, and it's called a robo hand. It's a little plot project. You can create a hand yourself with an application they offer. You can download a hand and print it yourself if you have access to a printer. And these little pieces of plastic can be downloaded as files, they can be emailed as files, and printed anywhere in the world. So that means the designer in Seattle can send it to someone in South Africa and pretty much start this revolution of the RoboCamp. Uh, the 3D printers cost around $600 now on the cheap end to $5,000 for the ones that we in this room might buy. If you have a company, you might get an upgrade, they can go up to $100,000, $20,000. But you know, in the range of 600 to 5,000, you can get a 3D printer that can print things for you. Um, and how it works is you take a 3D file that's usually built on a, a CAD software, um, and we'll talk about CAD in detail in a bit. Um, this file will take the object that's in 3D, convert it into machine code, uh, which we call G code, and G code controls the machine to tell how to print it out. The 3D printers. Um, Generally, about the size of a, a giant microwave, maybe a little taller than that. Um, they have this spaghetti-like plastic in the back, and it's on a spindle, and it's about the size of a thick piece of spaghetti that gets fed through a heated uh, head, an extrusion head. And that extrusion head will push it out about the size of a thick hair, and that thick hair layers down, layer by layer, and it fills these three models up. Now, um, small pieces, uh, you can imagine a chest piece, might take about three minutes to print, uh, depending on the printer. Larger pieces can take several hours. You're usually restricted by the size of the, the, uh, the bed of your printer is. So, the problem with 3D printers 
and so people were blind and visually impaired, the software that generated the 3D file was usually a visual software. Uh, some CAD software, Autodesk, um, there's uh, web-based ones, there are products like Google called SketchUp. Um, but there is a software called, uh, and actually a standard called OpenSCAD. Uh, OpenSCAD is a uh, text-based scripting language and in this language, you essentially can define primitive shapes, sizes. You can do differences on these shapes and objects. So if you had two circles, one bigger than the other, you could do a difference of the two circles and make a ring. Um, this file is just its essentially four lines of code. And with that four lines of code, you can then make a ring of any size that you need. Now, the, uh, the file on OpenSCAD is just uh, the text, and then on the one panel of the program, they have a 3D rendering of it. You would take this file out and then export it to an SD card or USB, and then um, plug it into your printer and print it out. Now, OpenSCAD is it's tricky. It's not um, the easiest thing in the world, but it's also kind of math based. So, for people who really enjoy math and kind of the formulas of uh, loops and iteration and functional thinking, uh, OpenSCAD is kind of great. But for simple shapes, if you were to imagine you had a chunk of Play-Doh, and you kind of prototype out um, an object that you want to make in plastic. You could take, say, say you want to make a little um, a cocoa for your apartment. You could have a square or a rectangle. And then if you want to have, that's going to be the top of the, of the cocoa. And you have a little circle piece on the bottom that's going to be some sort of decoration. And sticking up out of that circle is going to be a hook or some sort of uh, piece that sticks in the opposite direction or the Z, the Z direction. Uh, now, you take these three shapes, the square, the circle, and the rod, and you can type them individually into the OpenSCAD, put them together, and kind of render out a 3D object. Now, it's, it's tricky. You can imagine if, if you're blind, you could take the Play-Doh, you could measure it by the best uh, against whatever device you like to measure with. This could be a tactile ruler, this could be, you just want to get it to the size of a uh, deck of playing cards. Take that measurement, and you essentially, I think OpenSCAD works mainly in millimeters and centimeters. Convert it into millimeters, that, that size, and you type out, you know, square, parentheses, uh, you do H equals for height, Y equals for uh, width, and then you kind of can print out a top <coughs> of that size. Now this is the only real way for non-visual had development at this time. Um, there might be other solutions that I haven't heard about, but OpenSCAD is kind of the one that's been tossed around. Largely, uh, it's not been used uh, for people who are blind and visually impaired, which is odd considering it does actually do kind of beautiful structures of math, and um, it, it can just allow the text of math to be physically printed. Um, one thing people have made with OpenSCAD is uh, they've converted a, a really simple way to make Braille 3D printed labels. Um, and they have a function, and this function can accept a string or a sentence that you might want to say, and it will then loop through and iterate out the Braille dots for you into a file that can be printed. Um, the other uh, tactile maps have been really uh, exciting the last few uh, years where you can actually go to Google Maps and go to other online map sources, get the LIDAR data or the geographic topology data, download that, convert it into a 3D file, and then that 3D file can be printed out. Now, it's this might sound a little dry and boring, but it's actually it's getting better in the sense that the conversion of you know image-based materials that do show depth and graphics can be converted into a 3D file fairly easily and then print it out. Um, the reason I got a 3D printer was of a, of a thing called the Free Universal Construction Kit. Um, they're, they're, yeah, their they're acronym is FU. Uh, the Free Universal Construction Kit allows you to take any construction toy that you might have as a child Lego, Duplo, Kinex, um, and about the 17 other ones that they have. They made a matrix of all of these made together. So I have some demos, I'll, I'll bring them out um, at the end, if anyone wants to come up with a 3D printed object. 
I have a Lincoln Log Lego adapter. And now the Lincoln Log Lego adapter allows me to play both with my Lincoln Logs and my Legos at the same time. So the Lincoln Logs can adapt either way. Now, you can download all the 90 parts. If anyone's been to the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, they actually have them on display there uh, right now. And they're, they're, they're fun to pick up and feel. If you, if you want to kind of guess which object you're holding, it's like the 12th part Lincoln Log, it's part Connect, I'm not sure. But, that was the one reason I wanted to get a 3D printer for my space. And I, I probably use it once a week. I don't use it a lot. Um, but we print out little things. Um, but the, the Lego is one of those. So there's a great website, Thingiverse, thingiverse.com, and people can share their things. And they can, you can take other people's things, mash them into your things, download them. Okay. Any questions about 3D printers? I have a question. The 3D printer that you bought, is it high enough quality to make a car or something complex? How big is this car? I mean, I just, I've read articles, I've read articles like you have about somebody printing, you know, a, a car that works. Yes, I've seen that car. It's, it looks, I'm not getting that car. But, uh, <laughs> But he did print each piece individually, and uh, the thing is, you can make these machines uh, yourself. And so you could make them whatever size you needed. So if you had uh, a six foot by six foot area to make a machine, you could make fenders, doors, and other pieces of the car. So yes, you can attach it together. Uh, my printer is smaller. Um, it is about 20 inches by 18 inches. And then the bed is only about 11 inches by 9 inches. Could you make a toy car? Yes, you could make a toy car. Moving wheels? With moving wheels. Really? So they have, I didn't print it out, I wanted to print this out. NASA, so the space station now has a 3D printer. And the first object they printed was a ratchet, uh, a working ratchet that you can turn in the direction. Um, they just have the file, and I was going to print it out this morning, and I was like, this is going to take three hours. So, but um, they have the working ratchet one. I have a working uh, nut and bolt. Um, that uh, initially was not, it, the threading of it was kind of tight, but as I worked on it, it got really nice and slick. Um, and I, there's, a, there's people you have to make gears and mechanisms that can kind of spin freely. And so they, they, and you can print some of these things in one go. You can sometimes print things in multiple pieces and combine them back together, but the NASA wrench is actually one piece. So you print the entire thing, and by the, you can watch it print layer by layer, so it kind of looks like an X-ray view as you see the bits of uh, bits of plastic being laid down, the different gears being built, but at the same time the handles being built, <coughs> and then eventually everything finishes off with a nice clean uh, handle. Question? Question over here. Yes, ma'am. If the um, plastic part is moving around, are you comfortable, or like, you know, like, you have to go into the top? Right, well, that, yeah. I mean, that's, so there are more and more 3D printers available in the city. Um, there are um, maker spaces in most of the bur boroughs, and a maker space is basically a place where you can kind of join and kind of participate in using the tools that they have there. It's kind of a shared work, work studio. Um, there's also ways to just uh, send it out online. There's companies, there's one in Long Island City called Shapeways, and Shapeways will you'll upload your 3D file. And they'll let you print it in like seven different types of plastic, uh, five different types of metal, and ceramic. So there's this, there's a guy that made these uh, espresso cups. He made 30 espresso cups, one a day for a month. And they were, you know, half, one looked like a rocket ship, one looked like a monster, one you couldn't you could sit it down straight because it had a round bottom. Um, and he just was able to figure it out. It's not cheap. Um, but if you have something that you want to maybe sell in mass, make it like a, a lot of jewelers like it, you can make bracelets, and you can um, stain the steel. You can put your object up there. People will then buy it from Shapeways. Shapeways will print it on demand, and you'll get a little money from that transaction. Um, but Shapeways is awesome. Uh, there's, other, there's other sites online that will also do it. Um, but yeah, there's also a, a website called 3D Hub. And 3D Hub will let you search your neighborhoods and where you live to see if there's a 3D printer nearby. And you can kind of uh, either buy time on it for an hour or two. What's that called again? 3D <coughs> Hub. 3D Hub. H-U-B. I'm not sure if it's a .com, just Google that one. 
Um, okay, the next tool is, uh, oh sorry, there was one more question back. Sorry, you have with a hat on, yes. Yes, sir. Um, I worked for the Board of Elections, and I remember last year, Chuck Schumer was trying to make a proposal to ban using that 3D printer because now, at that time they were making plastic guns. Right, yeah. yeah. That's what I mean, I mean yeah, it, it comes up a lot, the whole gun situation. Um, you make guns out of wood, you make guns out of metal, you make guns out of a lot of things. So you think it's so. different materials? I mean, actually, we're just talking about plastic. Yeah. Think it's ceramic and, yeah. And, uh, yeah, you can, yeah. I'm not sure what shape it would do if you print these send them a gun file. Yeah. I'm not sure what they would do. Well, the other thing I was listening was that, uh, that the guy that was printing them out, I saw it in the <coughs> internet in Facebook, uh, he put a, by law you have to put a little piece of metal on it in case you're going by a scan or going to the plane. Mm -hmm. I thought that was bogey. Yeah. Yeah. And new tech, right? New tech, new problems. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to go next to the CNC machine. CNC machine is one of my favorites. So a, a 3D printer lays net. Uh, plastic down layer by layer by layer, slowly builds it up over time. Um, it's called an additive manufacturing process. Um, a CNC is the opposite, it's a milling machine. So you put a piece of material down, a piece of wood, a piece of plastic, um, you can put aluminum down in the fancy machines, um, and you mill out the object from that material. Um, now, if you, the best example is if you were to order cabinets for your kitchen, the cabinet maker has a CNC machine, or he has access to someone that does have a CNC machine. You pick a design out of a set of templates that he has, and uh, that wood gets fed through a machine, and then that turns into the cabinets that you have. There's very little hand routing done on professional cabinets anymore. Um, if you want really high end cabinets, maybe you can convince the people to uh, use a hand router. But uh, it's largely computer driven, uh, and that's amazing. Uh, one story I'll share, we had uh, a workshop at our uh, space uh, about a year and a half ago. There's a young guy with uh, cerebral palsy. He was 15, complete computer nerd. He had an iPad in one hand and a laptop in the other. Didn't do anything until he gave him a Wi-Fi password, and then he'd start communicating with him. Uh, but he wanted to make an iPad holder out of wood for himself. And so pretty, pretty uh, good starter project. Uh, you can imagine what an iPad holder would be if you had a thin piece of wood. You, you have a rectangle that's cut out. Uh, could be uh, curved on the ends or on the corners. And then there's a small pocket cut out on the inside of that and a little hole kind of that. Now, the software that you use to make uh, this design is very similar to what you could use if you could use OpenSCAD to create it. So traditionally, it's a visual software like Adobe Illustrator or some other program. You can draw rectangles, circles, stars, any shape you would need. You can draw paths um, point by point. If you know the X and Y, you could manually enter in that position by hand. Those shapes appear on the screen. So that's your design. You go over to the right side of the tool, and this is all available for the menu bar as well, key strips. You decide what tool is going to cut out that design. Now this is really neat. So this is your telling the machine, I have this design, and I want you to cut it out of this material, and here's what I'm going to tell you to do. I can cut it on the line, I can cut inside the line, outside the line, how deep I want to cut, all the way through the material, or just a little bit, how fast, and then what bit am I going to be using? So in your mind, you want to think about a CNC machine as this. So they come in varying sizes, anything from the size of a crock pot, rice cooker, to a king size bed. And they all have a mechanism that can move a routing, which is like a drill, uh, a routing bit around X, Y, and Z. X being left and right, Y being up and down, back and forth, and Z being um, from the top of the surface of the material to uh, removing up and away, um, maybe seven inches up from the material. Um, now this machine is controlled uh, by a software that has a design file converted into G code, position code for its um, It does take maybe an hour or two to kind of get the hang of like, the actual, how do I set up my, my vectors that I've made, my design file, into a tool path. Once you get that done, you, the basic mechanics are like, how do I determine which bit I use? How do I create this machine file? And then how do I convert, how do I program the machine to tell it to go? Um, and that's kind of the, the steps we walk through. Um, and so uh, this young man was able to create an iPad holder uh, in probably about an hour. Um, and the idea was that 
he uh, he was also he uses a wheelchair. He's nonverbal. There would have they would have never had him in a shop class at at school, right? And so it's not that there's many <coughs> shop classes, but if you think about accessible shop classes, this would be one of those things. Same with the three D printer. Same with the other tools that we're talking about. Um, this is a machine that will cut the material out for you. This is a machine that the uh, the military uses and uh, aer aerospace industry uses because they can make precise uh, holes for drilling, um, be up to a thousandth of an inch uh, precision in its milling quality. So it's very accurate. But at the same time, it's kind of a machine that if you don't have the full use of your um, your hands, <coughs> Or if you can't even see where the blade is, but you can control a computer, you could essentially control this machine. There's some there's some asides to that where you will need a person who uh, position the material in the correct spot on the machine. There's a specific spot on the machine where the material should be. You know, the machine has to know where zero zero is, where it has its starting point. Uh, but other than that, it's kind of you know a drive-through software machine. Um, there's machines that will even change the bit. So if you have a bit that does, it has a, maybe a nice, if you imagine like a spinning top with a nice uh, slanted uh, bottom, you can make a nice V carve through a piece of wood. Um, but you can have a straight bit, which will make a nice clean edge on your piece of wood. Um, there's a machine that will change the bit for you as your design file says, I need another bit. Um, the other cool thing is there's some tables where you don't even need to attach the material with screws or bolts, you can just use a vacuum table, and the vacuum table is essentially a vacuum table. That just sucks the material tight. And it's, um, yeah. So that one is great. Um, How about a copying feature? Like a copy, copy machine? Yes, and so the CNC machines, we have all go to 3D printers. There is a scanning tool, and there's a company in Brooklyn called MakerBot. You might have heard of them. Maker uh, MakerBot. Maker, watch, one word. Um, they actually have a, oh my, I don't even know the address. <laughs> down on Lafayette and Housing, there's this display store. I don't know, I just don't know the right address, but there's a MakerBot store. They have a tool called a scanner, and it kind of looks like a record player with a laser sensor attached to it. And you put your object, you know, the size of a coffee cup, um, not too large, on this kind of spinning device. And as it spins, the two lasers measure the size and um, shape of it. That gets turned into a 3D file. You could, you could put you know, uh, chess pieces on there, you could put your grandmother's trinkets on there, you scan them, print them out, turn them into ornaments. Um, you can take those files, mash them together, you know, a massive <coughs> trinket object. Um, uh, it's up to you. That's the one for scanning smaller objects. There's a, on the CNC, there's an attachment called a probe, and a probe will go around, and it just looks like a, a blunt needle that kind of goes around and it touches the sides of the object. Um, now, if you were to imagine, say you had a tactile map that you wanted to recreate. This is a good example. Maybe there's some copyright issues here, so maybe this shouldn't be recorded. But tactile map you want to recreate because the company's out of business. You can put this map down into a probing uh, bed. The CNC is not cutting at this point, it's just probing. It's going to drag the probe over the object that's flat enough to not to have too much resistance on it and it'll generate a 3D file for you. You can then use that 3D file to cut out another map if you want. You could do this with, say, um, <coughs> many people want to do? So the, the CNC I have in my shop is really, it, it can go left and right, back and forth, up and down. That's three axes. There's ones that do five axes. And if you think of what is that, that is if you have a block of wood, you could cut on five sides of a cube. You can't cut the bottom side of the cube. So with that, you'll have a five-axis thing where you can cut on all sides. So. I have a question. Um, yes. How accessible are these machines to buy, price-wise or whatever? How, how hard do they get? The machines, the machines are pricey. They come with a lot of uh, uh, setup and space requirements. Um, we got a grant. That's how we got our CNC machine. Uh, the grant was about, uh, the machine that we bought was kind of pre put together, it was $8,600. So, uh, but this is kind of a smaller version. It was made in North Carolina, this company called ShopBot, another bot company. 
Um, amazing company that's been around since you know, late 80s, early 90s. They make professional machines. Um, the 3D printer was uh, $2,100 our level, um, which is affordable for um, most school programs, libraries, um, and other places that can kind of fundraise not a huge amount of money, but it's a, good, a good amount of money pretty quickly. Um, the material for the, the 3D printers usually costs about $45, $50 a kilo before they measure it. Um, and it's a big spindle of material. Um, and how much does a kilo of plastic make? It makes about a uh, <coughs> um, 315 chess pieces is what it makes. So you can print out 315 pieces. So I'm going to not take up too much time. I'm going to go a little bit here. Laser cutters are awesome. They're like the same as a CNC machine. You can put your design file in there and you can cut it out, but with the precision of a laser. Um, very fine lines. Kind of harder to access because they usually require uh, large ventilations. They cost in the range of twenty thousand dollars and up. Um, but programs uh, around the city, major spaces around the city, do have access to them. And, uh, those are also tools you can send out. There's a website called Pinoco, and your three D file can get cut out for you and mailed back to you. Um, I have a case up here uh, at the end of the talk. I have a, a circuit inside of a plastic case that was cut out of. Uh, an eighth inch acrylic, and with that, it can just snap together then. Um, so it has a nice tight fit. Uh, okay, we only have a few minutes, but I want to get on electronics. Um, does anyone want to hear about an embroidery machine? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so we'll do, we'll do embroidery machines quick. Embroidery machines are amazing. You can take a graphic file, or a drawing you've made, or a photograph you have, and it can convert into a file that can add stitches to it. Um, it gets even better. Uh, the, stitches, the stitches are, it's a normal, so um, Singer has a product out, Singer Sewing Machines has a product out called Futura, and Futura has kind of a platform, um, I think it's about, the, the, the sewing area is about the size of an airplane dining tray. Flaps down. It's not huge, but it's not small. Um, and you can move the material around as needed. What happens is you give the file to uh, software from Singer, which I haven't actually tested to see if it's extremely very accessible. Um, but what you can do is uh, take a file in different colors. So if you had a design of three colors, it'll have three different stitching mechanisms for you to kind of uh, take your file and, and color it out. Um, now what gets really fun here is that there's some new material called conductive fabrics and threads. Uh, now this will get into the electronics a little bit, but um, conductive thread is essentially, it sounds like it, it's a wire, but it's fabric. And so you could use this to make, does anyone have gloves that they can use their touch screens with? Yes. So you probably have some conductive thread or some conductive fabric in those gloves. Essentially it is, the capacitance of your body is going through this conductive material and onto your screen. Um, you can also use it for powering LEDs and little electronic circuits on your wearables. Um, on a light made a dress that has a Wi-Fi detector on it, and it kind of shows the signal strength of the network around her. Um, she's great. And uh, one thing people do with the uh, embroidery machines is that they can use conductive thread and essentially stitch a circuit and use that circuit. And the circuit can have switches in it. You can use snaps, little snaps. And you can have essentially a full circuit uh, in a garment a piece of uh, cloth. Um, it does a lot more. I don't actually, uh, I've never really used one, but I never just an amazing little machine. Um, so into electronics, though, uh, has anyone, um, okay, this goes into taking your toys apart. Has anyone taken their electronic toys apart when they were kids? And did you ever stick a piece of metal in there to see what <laughs> The battery toy, not the ones you plug into the wall, but the battery toys. Um, we're going to talk about battery toys today, just so you know. <laughs> um, if you were to imagine what a switch is, or what a circuit is, in its most basic form is you're going to have some sort of power source Let's say a battery. And then you're going to have two wires, one on either side of the battery, the, uh, the connector. And then you're going to say, let's see we'll have a component on this. We'll put a buzzer. 
And a buzzer could be a piezoelectric buzzer. It could be some other audio thing that we have. Uh, but um, essentially, we wire that up. There's going to be two connectors on the buzzer for each of those wires. And when we plug it in, it's going to complete the circuit and we're going to get some noise. Now, if we were to cut one of those wires, we can make a switch now. And essentially, when we cut one of those wires, we can touch those two wires that have been cut together and make a switch. This is kind of how we do the toy hacking. Um, but there's a lot of other components we can throw in there. Um, we can have input devices, things that we can control, and we can have output devices, things that can kind of uh, change the world for us. So the input device is the simplest one is the switch. Um, we also have volume knobs, potentiometer type of things, light sensors, microphones, force sensors, you can step on at the grocery store and the door opens, uh, motion sensors, and distance sensors, just to name a few of the different types of sensors. Those will all take electricity in, and you'll kind of sense the world around you in some way, and give you some output that you can use in your circuit. And then outputs, outputs, we have audio, light, mechanical movement, radio waves for communication. We have transistors and relays, so we can do uh, kind of logic and control other electronic devices. Okay, this is great, but if you can't see the wires and you can't see the components and you can't see the breadboard that you're supposed to prototype on, how do you use them? There's a company right now, right on 26th Street, and, uh, Hudson River, and they're called Little Bits. And Little Bits is a way we've been trying out to have accessible circuits for people who are blind and low vision. And Little Bits are little components, and they have magnets on them. And so you have a battery pack that has magnets on it. You have a switch component that has magnets on the other end. You have a, a light, you have a buzzer, you have a motor, and all these can be magnet connected together. So by touch, and hopefully maybe with some for a labeling, you could find out which component you're holding, but then you can snap them together without worrying about the wires and where they should be going, but you can prototype electronics with little bits. Um, and it can get pretty sophisticated. Has anyone used the website if this than that? Yeah. So they have a component that can connect to the Wi-Fi of your apartment. Um, and you can have uh, a notification either coming in or an action that you perform on the circuit going out, if this and that. So you get an email, comes in, you can have a bell ring with little bits Ooh. on your top. Uh, now that's the simplest of the circuits. The downside of little bits, they are expensive. Um, even for a person who will buy all the electronics that you can see, I only have one kit. Um, but I think it's a good start. Uh, usually we prototype electronics with wires and, and breadboards. And these breadboards have really small little holes in them that have metal on the bottom that we can then touch. But it's, there is no tactile feedback on a breadboard to really let you know where you are. Um, so we're going to go to the Arduino now. The Arduino is a programmable controller. And this is kind of the exciting thing. A lot of people, and this is kind of one of my problems with uh, teaching college students about this the technology, they usually come up with first product to come up with, I'm going to attach a distance sensor to a, a cane. Okay. <laughs> We've seen this a lot. Um, so it's a good learning project. The distance sensor will detect if there's an object in front of the person, uh, and it can also be used to map out uh, the world around them in this case. But uh, there's other things you can do with Arduinos. The Arduino allows you to put all these electronic components together and then also control how they're uh, connected together. Um, so you can program it to have audio control appliances, uh, notification systems, internet connected devices. Um, that was my segue into internet connected devices really fast. Uh, we only have a few minutes, but I want to talk about the exciting thing that's happening right now that doesn't really exist, but it's happening in a small little bit of an industry Bluetooth low energy devices and internet connected things. Um, does anyone have anything at home that is internet connected or that they can toggle on and off from their phone or from their computer? Why are those headphones? Bluetooth. Bluetooth one. And little speaker. Like the bowl. How about um, any appliances? Sonos. 
The nest? Let the garage door openers I've heard every time. Hmm. And you can open up and close with your iPhone. Great. So there's a standard that's coming out now with Bluetooth Low Energy, and I think Bluetooth Low Energy is on its fourth version now, or 4.2 is coming out. What's exciting about Bluetooth, and this is going to get really nerdy fast, but they, the devices and peripherals <laughs> around your house will soon be able to broadcast their functionality. Which, what this means is that you can have, there's an app on um, the iPhone right now called Blue, Light Blue. Um, and what it does is it picks up all the Bluetooth devices in the room, and it tells you which ones you can connect into and what functionality you can do on that device. Now there's obviously some security issues that we're not going to talk about here. But if your house was able to, every appliance in your house was able to tell you what it could do and how you could control it, this means that reading the temperature on the oven display, it could be done through your phone. Wow. Getting notified when your wash is done, I mean, could be done. Um, so the idea, the simplest idea of this, let's think about uh, a microwave and the functionality you can do for a microwave. What are the inputs for a microwave besides the food coming into it? Your inputs are, you can set the time for it, you can set the power, there might be a popcorn button, but a lot of those now are very flat. And unless you label it yourself, you're not going to get a lot of help. But with Bluetooth Energy and connected devices, the exciting thing is that manufacturers could decide to make this available either by an app that they make or make it publicly available for apps that other people make to interface with. Yeah. They can say, these are the functionalities that you can add to this microwave right now. So I can set the time through my phone and press go and it would set the time. I can get notified of the time duration, like duration and it elapsing down. And I can also get notification of it being finished all through my phone. Um, now this is, this is, you think about stoves, um, you can think about washing machines, you can think about door locks, um, there's a lot of things. Which one? Thermostats, yeah. Televisions. Um, so anything that can have a Bluetooth low energy connection could essentially broadcast itself in its own functionality. Now this hasn't really been talked about a lot, mainly because the devices are still getting set in a standard. So Internet of Things really talks about, oh, you can turn your lights on and your air conditioning on before you get home. Okay, great. Um, but the accessibility side of having Internet of Things and functionality from applications and appliances to be able to say, this is what I can do for you, this is what I can tell you, and then have an application that can change those controls, that's very exciting. And I wish I had better examples, but it has, doesn't really exist yet. Uh, there is one item you can buy, and it's a Bluetooth controlled light socket at Home Depot. It's a fifty dollar light socket, and you can control it with your phone. You can control it with raw programming data. Um, so that's one. My, my big call here, though, I think is um, the reason we started to have reliability is that we want more people with disabilities involved with the design production and the execution of these products. Um, there's a, I'm a programmer by day to pay my bills. Um, I see how programmers work, the shortcuts they take, and I know why the web isn't as accessible as it could be. Um, it's shortcuts, it's not standards. And if it was standards, we wouldn't really be having so many conferences about web accessibility. Um, if people who are blind uh, want to think about programming, it's totally doable. It's not going to be an easy start. There's a lot of code editors that don't allow, um, well, they don't have screen reader access. But then there's also a bunch of people, I know, Google who are blind with programming. Um, there. So it's, it's one of these things where we need people with disabilities to think about programming, to think about engineering, and to think about STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we need to kind of find a way to bring this back where the tools we're making for the little bits, for getting kids interested in electronics, that they also have a whole other you know, use for an audience that has never really been introduced in electronics. So with that, I'm, I want to take some questions. Is there anything that I didn't talk about that people want to talk about? Okay. So, ah.
Yes. But that's right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, going, going back to who, who thought of the idea about the 3D printer? About the 3D printer? Yeah. Sorry. Star Trek, probably. <laughs> 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 <It's> not <Star> <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, they've been around for years, actually. Uh, a long time. Um, and now I think they've just gotten to the point where getting little motors is inexpensive enough from China. So I think we kind of started for you for the company. Um, and the software, there's, there was, so I think the big movement happened with this open source community called RepRap. And the RepRap was a free, well, it was an open source community of 3D printer um, hobbyists. And it's kind of like, if you go to <coughs> fairs where 3D printers are, the majority of those printers spawned out of the RepRap machine, which came out of a university, um, and I forget the name of it. MakerBot also was a RepRap until they got money, and then they became closed source 3D printer. Quite a name of that. It's a great question. Um, yes, yes. I was, uh, I was reading an article about a project that was happening in Spain I think last year where um, the, this company was taking photographs and creating 3D images and printing them and then allowing people who were blind to experience memories actually come through those pictures. And I'm just curious, like, what, uh, have you ever worked with anything like that? Or, would you, would you, how would that, how would that be something that would happen? Do you have a memory you'd like to relief? Uh, probably, I think, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think they use the, they use the relief uh, functionality. Um, and what happens is you can take a photograph. I know on the CNC, it's fairly easy with the software. You can import an image and it turns into a relief file, which kind of has raised edges based off of the, the area of the file it tries to decide. Um, it tries to use shadows sometimes if the software is sophisticated. Um, and then you could, so I, I think a CNC machine would actually do a really nice job with that. Um, I've seen some really strange baby ornaments of like, you know, newborn babies. Their photographs turn into wood reliefs. And yeah, they just look like flat little baby heads. Um, but it's, it's an amazing little thing. And uh, you could do that. Yeah, and I think the 3D printer could do it as well. Um, the CNC would, you know, CNC is more fun. It's loud, it's dangerous. Um, uh, the 3D printer could do it as well. Um, and they, the, the thing that they do with the reliefs on 3D printers is largely they do topographical maps, um, dating, uh, data charts from uh, some sort of stock index. So, what were you going to say? Yeah, my wife, uh, she does plaster uh, casts, yes. bringing famous faces. Now, can we do that without plastic? These machines are screwed so from uh, a probe. You could use the probe. So here's an interesting thing that happened a few years ago. MakerBot, the company, went to uh, the Met, the museum of town, and they had a 3D scanning day. And with this, they used a software that was used your phone and used your camera, and you would take a series of photographs all the way around this statue. And what they did, that only took a few minutes to take a series of photographs, maybe 40, 50 photographs all the way around the statue, top to bottom, 360 degrees around it. And it turns it in with the software, it turns those photographs into a 3D model. Then they took the next 48 hours to clean up those 3D models because the software wasn't perfect, but it still did an amazing job. And you can go to Thingiverse website and you can actually get the 3D models to print out of those statues. So, you could take a series of photographs around someone's head and probably convert it into a 3D object. Yeah. And people have done this. Actually, yeah, I, I, there was a guy at Coney Island. He had a full body scanner. And what he wanted to do at Coney Island is if you were there and walking by, he might ask you to come in so he could scan you and print you out for the little town that he was making to make a replica of Coney Island. And, um, and what it was is he actually used the Xbox Connect from Microsoft. And he had a pulley system so it would step up and down the height of a person. And from there, he was able to kind of turn it into a, a 3D model. Um, so yeah, it's, it's fun. People have done some strange, wonderful things with it. The resolution of the print is good. Uh, it could be better. But you can also tweak it with software. You can go into that 3D model, 
if you had, and this is more of like a visual CAD software, you could go in and change it. What's the name of that website called? Uh, Thingiverse is the thing I verse. Yes, sir. Um, is your company offering courses to teach uh, that easily? We're planning on it, yes. We don't have anything in the next few weeks, but the website for our, our organization is DIYAbility.org. Um, that would be DIY. And DIYAbility, A B I L I T Y. Um, it's, it's the word disability with the S taken out. Um, <coughs> the, we are actually on um, 36th Street and 8th Avenue, 313 West 36th Street. <coughs> and does anyone know Adaptive Design Association? Does anyone know Adaptive Design? Yeah. Okay. So we share space with them, they're a great organization. Um, so yeah. The Internet, of Connect the Internet of Things, the connected devices of the world in the future, will be great. And I think this because the devices that we'll make will broadcast the functionality out to the world. Not just for you know the Best Buy consumer and the average person using their phone saying, I want to turn my air conditioning on before I get home. But that functionality can also be very local for, for people who have a disability or they can't touch the device, they can't see the device. Um, I think this is going to be a really big deal. But it does, it also takes a lot of pushing. I'm telling the organizations and the companies that you want this function to be available on um, And then they kind of have to take the standard because taking the standard is the cheaper route. That's my question. Any other questions? Oh, okay, sorry. Yes, ma'am. All the way over. Oh, sorry, one second. May? Yes, you over there. Do you, do you spoke about an embroidery machine? Do you have, do they have a crochet machine? She was asking, she said about the, next to the embroidery machine, do they have a crocheting machine? And I do not know. I can look it up. Um, you can also look up on Google, you can look up computer control. There's a knitting machine. There's knitting machines, yeah. Um, they're probably trickier than the embroidery machine. The embroidery machine is really small sewing mechanisms and just like, you know, just a normal sewing machine that has a cable that can move back and forth. Um, and so the idea is you could essentially make a design and then sew it out many times. The same design can be sewed out many times in the same exact way. Um, but it's not as all the trouble of a normal sewing machine where the stitches could fall out, the threading could fall off the machine. Um, but usually there's sensors on the machine that take that. But the crocheting, I don't know yet. But um, you know, the first computer was a, a, a loom. And the punch cards control how they really need to And essentially, you know, textiles and the textile industry shaped the computer industry. And then we realized we can use punch cards to count people coming into the Ellis Island. And, 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 so. Yes? Okay, so Yes. Yeah. And I think they don't talk. And so I, I think I'm hoping that the functionality of the future printers that are connected will broadcast the functionality to your phone. And so you can use either the screen that they provide or the device that you use and be able to find the functionality of that. So that I think is the hope of the future. I think that's it, bro. Thank you. Thank you.